They made all the mistakes in the industry and, and their businesses are now very substantial businesses. If there's one company out there that could disrupt the supply chain, it certainly can be Amazon. what drives prices. And I want to start with the prices for shingles. Mm -hmm. um, recently, they almost doubled in the last decade. Mm -hmm. uh, it's commodity product. Mm -hmm. uh, what roofers want to know and cannot comprehend or understand why every year we're getting all the letters of price increases from Beacon, ABC, mm -hmm. price keeps going up regardless of oil prices. It never goes down, mm -hmm. it always goes up and uh, we're a commodity business. But in commodity world, the price for metals, for asphalt, goes up and down, mm -hmm. supply and demand. Why it's not happening in the roofing industry? Boy, that's a complex question, and it, 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 it'll require a little bit of time and uh, patience. And I've studied this. Uh, after, I, I should also say, after um, we sold the business, um, I had an opportunity to be president and CEO of a, of a roofing distribution cooperative uh, called Nemion, which Roof Depot was a part of it, for uh, smaller to mid-sized. United Products here in the Twin Cities was also part of that. Uh, and one of my duties there was to study just that question. You know, where, where is pricing? Uh, you know, we did a lot of forecasting. Uh, we wanted our distribution uh, uh, members to know where pricing was going so they could be ahead of the curve. Uh, dist distributors make money off of buying low and selling high, obviously. Uh, and uh, you know they certainly wanted to be on the cutting edge of, of information in the marketplace, and my job was to deliver that to them. So I've spent a lot of time researching what drives pricing in the industry, and, and frankly, it's, it's complex, and a lot of times it does not make sense. But to go back to that 2008, um, you know, question, you know, we've seen shingles double in price and what happened. Uh, to me, there was kind of a, a, a perfect storm and it wasn't a bad thing for the industry. In fact, I think it was one of the best things that happened to our industry. Uh, two, or three things ha two or three things happened at one time. Um, I'll start out off with the acquisition of uh, Elk, if you remember Elk Shingles, uh, by GAF, which was in, I think it was in around 2007. Um, Elk had uh, the technology of uh, producing a low-cost laminate. They were the first manufacturer that just eliminated three tabs. They only made a laminate shingle. That was their focus, and they developed, uh, um, you know, very, uh, you know, methods of producing that shingle that were very, uh, um, you know, that, that where, where they were the low-cost producer. Elk also was kind of the maverick in the industry. If they wanted to take market share in any marketplace they were involved in, they were strong in the West Coast, they are strong kind of in the Southeast, uh, they could do it because their cost of, of producing a shingle was much less than uh, the other shingle manufacturers that had kind of antiquated uh, uh, processes, antiquated equipment and such. Uh, so when GAF acquired Elk, they kind of took that maverick, um, out of the marketplace, you know, that, that uh, uh, manufacturer that, you know, we're going to take share, we're going to do it on price and nobody's going to stop us, attitude. So that was kind of the first thing. And GF also acquired that, uh, you know, that, that technology, that low cost uh, technology. And that was about the same time you started to see weights and shingles dropping, you know, fairly dramatically. Um, you know, when I was in distribution, we used to get, I think, 12 or 13 pallets on a truck. All of a sudden, one day, we started to get 14 pallets and 15 pallets on a truck. Same weight, just more pallets would show up on a, on a truckload of shingles. And uh, What was uh, driving that? Just uh, profit margins? Because, um, I mean, that's a big difference. Yeah. Well, 10, 15 percent? Uh, if, you, if you talk to GAF, um, you know, the, they will say that, that you know, uh, Kind of like, well, you look at me and you look at you, you know, fat and muscle. You know, they took the fat out and kept the muscle in the shingle. That was one of their, uh, you know, their, uh, um, you know, sales advertisements as to why the weight was going down. When you look at companies like IKO at the other time, they were proning the fact that their shingles were heavier. I know, you know, I, 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 I'm not on the technical end of the shingle industry. Um, you know, I know there's fillers, um, you know, I think when when shingles went to fiberglass versus versus uh, organic, uh, you would uh, rather than um, soak, you know, the the organic mat, which is basically cardboard in in asphalt with fiberglass. You would encapsulate that fiberglass tube, you know, around asphalt. But asphalt is also the most expensive 
ingredient of the shingle. Yeah, one of the it's, most it's about 33% of the cost of a shingle from what I understand. And uh, yeah, it, it can be the most expensive and, and, and the most volatile because it's closely tied to petroleum. Yes. Although it does not follow what we see at the gas pumps on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's a whole history behind that too. But um, um, you know, when Elk acquired, or when GF acquired Elk, uh, they, they acquired that low cost and they took the Maverick out of the marketplace. Uh, and around 2000, I want to say it was 2008 or 2009, somewhere in that, one of those summers, 2008, that's when you saw shingle prices and you were in the roofing industry. It was very aggravating for you, I'm sure. But uh, we were selling shingles uh, for around 45, 50 bucks a square for a laminate shingle. And, and by the end of the summer, our pricing was up around 80, 90 dollars a square, virtually doubled in about a 90 day period of time. Um, at that point in time, we did have a, a crisis and a shortage of, of asphalt. Um, $140 per barrel, per barrel price went up. Uh, yeah, price went up. Uh, asphalt is about half a percent of the petroleum industry. And uh, through, uh, um, you know, through refinement mes methods, uh, uh, the, the petroleum industry has figured out how to make less asphalt. Asphalt in the old days when I got in the industry in 1980 was a byproduct. Uh, you you could not control the asphalt supply. It just kind of happened. It was it's literally the bottom of the barrel, yeah. and uh, um, and you couldn't you couldn't control it. And there were times when uh, manufacturers were uh, just dumping asphalt in fields because they had nowhere to put it. And then there were times when there were as many shortages of asphalt. So it's always been this kind of this volatile product. But uh, somewhere in the mid '80s uh, into the '90s, uh, petroleum manufacturers, uh, you know. Uh, realized that you could kind of crack those molecules and extract more petroleum product and less asphalt out of, uh, you know, out of a barrel of oil. And they started to get in a position where they could control the supply of asphalt. They can make more asphalt or less asphalt through their refined refining methods uh, versus just being a byproduct and having to sell it in an open market, whatever the market would bear at that time. So they started saying, okay, today we're gonna make more asphalt or today we're gonna make less asphalt. But when you saw petroleum go up to $140 a barrel, asphalt went from about $350 a ton to over $1,000 a ton in about a 30 day period of time. Wow. And there were some shortages on that. Which so really- that, That's what drove the price. That's what drove the Plus price. Plus probably around. delivery uh, freight cost too, because the gas was $4. Exactly, yeah, everything went up and uh, the pricing went up uh, substantially and it was quick. Uh, it was aggravating for contractors. Um, I was I was out of the distribution business at that end and I was working for CEO of a, uh, of a, of a roofing cooperative. And just a little bit of funny story that kind of leads into you know, what I think this did to our industry a little bit. Uh, I had, a, I got a call one day from an old roofing contractor friend of mine, and we were, we were friends by this time. I wasn't selling him materials anymore. And he called me and he spent about 10 minutes on the phone just, just bitching at me, just screaming about how, you know, everybody's screwing me on price. Distributors are crooks. Uh, manufacturers are crooks. Everybody, everything's going up in price. All my customers are mad at me because I can't honor my contracts and life sucks and my crews are mad at me and everything is, everything is going wrong. And then he said, but Earl, I've never made more money in my life. And, and the reason being is, and like we talked about a little bit on the phone the other day, a high tide raises all boats. And what that means is, you know, the, the roofing, uh, you know, roofing tends to be a non-discretionary purchase, which means if you need a roof, and roofs last about 20 years, maybe less, maybe a little bit more, but about 20 years, if your house, if the roof starts leaking and you need a roof, you need a roof, you need it now. And it doesn't matter if it's $15,000 for that roof or $20,000 for that roof, you need a roof. And, and it's not the kind of purchase that, the consumer makes every day. So they generally speaking don't know that the roof they're paying $20,000 for today was maybe 10 years ago or five years ago or last year, $15,000. All they know is they need it. How much is it? And how am I gonna pay for it? And uh, you know, and maybe in a store marketplace, they, they see some of these things, but you know, as far as pricing going up because they've had multiple roofs and they have to pay deductibles and such. But, but generally speaking, a consumer doesn't know. And uh, you know, they, they need it. They need it now. How much is it? How are we going to pay for it? That's all they care about. So, you know, if you're a if you're a contractor, well, first of all, I'll go back. If you're a distributor, 
and you're selling a shingle out the door for $50 a square and you, put, you can put four houses or five houses worth of product on a boom truck and send it on the road. And let's say, let's say it's $12,000 for four houses, $3,000 each going down the road, $12,000 make a delivery, come back, do it again in the afternoon. Um, all of a sudden pricing went from $50 to let's say $80 or $90. Now that truck going down the road is $20,000 and it's the same amount of space. It's the same, you're paying the driver pretty much the same. Gas is about the same price and all of a sudden your revenue is up. So if your margins remain relatively the same. But the volume probably the down, volume the is revenue up. is up. Yeah. yeah, so remember also what happened in 2008, we had the housing crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know, the, if you're in the drywall industry, your price dropped by about 30, 40% and your volumes drop by about 70%, you got creamed. If you're in the roofing industry, the pricing of, of the raw materials went up almost double, and because roofing is a non-discretionary, we still have storm damage, roofs are still wearing out. Um, yeah, housing starts went down substantially, but that was kind of replaced by storm damage and, and other things. So our, our business may have dropped 20% overall, but shingles but prices went up. So when you looked at the total volume of dollars, it was actually more. So, so the best industry to be in, in the construction you know, related during that time was roofing. Owens Corning as a public company, Beacon as a public company did pretty well. If you looked at uh, US Gypsum uh, is a great example. Uh, they went 24 or 25 quarters in a row of losing money. Uh, Owens Corning's uh, operating capital went from an average of three to five percent prior to 2000 and and let's say 2005 2006 uh, to in the in the 20 percent range and it's still there today yeah. you know it's a public company you can look look up to yeah. see you know see how Same they perform beacon. yeah be it, you know beacon uh, has going up. has think. some other drivers their their revenues and volumes went up their operating capital their EBITDA you know margins remained in the four to six percent range and I think they're maybe a little bit better today and, and the reason being is there's a lot of competition from uh, an ABC supply for instance SRS entered the marketplace around 2010 um, um, you know they're all vying for that contractor business so uh, they're they're their sales went up, their revenues went up, which is a good thing. Their margins remained relatively the same. They didn't go down. Uh, so, you know, they ended up, uh, you know, covering their operating expenses faster and, st and making ultimately more profit. But if you look down on a percentage basis, their margins really have not increased, you know, but, but their revenues increased because those truckloads leaving the yard had more dollars on them. Margins stayed the same. So it was a good thing. At the contractor level, if you were selling a house for, $12,000 and now it was $15,000, $18,000 for that same house. Um, it was still non-discretionary. They still needed it. Insurance companies were still paying for most of it. Um, and and if, uh, if, if a roofing contractor was smart and didn't lower his pricing, which most of you guys are, uh, then you're making more money on it, you know, per roof. So again, I'll end where I started. High tide raised all boats and it was not a bad thing. We have not seen those prices come down and I think a lot of that has to do with the attitude of manufacturing distribution uh, uh, which distribution went back to manufacturing when we did start to see a relaxing in pricing and said don't you dare lower prices.